Hello, I'm Tom Truxton. I'm an assisting pastor here at The Bridge. Welcome to our men's Bible study. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, so if you want to pull out your Bibles, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but you should be able to see the verses on the screen behind me as I get going here. One announcement uh, is next Saturday, June 18th at 9 a.m., we're going to have a, a men's breakfast. This is the third Saturday of every month, so I'd encourage you to come out and enjoy that time of fellowship and food. Wonderful food. Plenty of food. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this day and for this opportunity to share your word. And Lord, I just pray that this teaching will be a blessing to many people. And Lord, I thank you uh, that you gave me the time to, to be studying in your word. And Lord, I was surely blessed from learning more about Saul and Lord, just uh, the early church and how it progressed. And Lord, it's just been an awesome time in studying through your word in Acts. And so Lord, I just pray that uh, many others will see these teachings and uh, be blessed as well. Lord, thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. All right, again, if you're in your Bibles, uh, Acts chapter 9, flip over to uh, verse 26. Verses 1 through 25 I covered last week, so those are also posted online uh, through the YouTube um, channel. Uh, if you don't have the email that has the link in it, uh, please let one of the elders know and we can forward that link to you. As we get started, I want to just uh, show this similar map that I showed last week. Um, it shows all the way down to Jerusalem um, and then some cities coming up the, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, cities that we're going to be speaking about uh, in today's teaching. Uh, you see Jerusalem there, and then over to the northwest you see uh, Joppa. Uh, in between Jerusalem and Joppa, there's going to be a, a city called Lydda that we're going to be mentioning. Um, then as we go up the coast to Caesarea, we see there, and then further north, uh, a city called Tyre. Uh, that city also is going to come up during the teaching tonight. And then just uh, northeast of Tyre, we see uh, Damascus, and that's where last week we spoke about uh, Paul's Damascus Road experience where his conversion took place. Um, after, being, um, after speaking to the Lord as a bright light shining down him and he fell off his horse to the ground, uh, that was mentioned last week. And then as we go up the coastline and make a turn left, we see the city Tarsus there. And that's where Saul was um, raised. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, verse 26. This map I'll be showing it a couple more times during the course of the teaching just to remind us of some localities that are uh, spoken of in the scripture. So Acts 9, verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So they were terrified of Saul. Did they maybe think that Saul was uh, not converted and maybe that he was trying to infiltrate the ranks of the, the apostles and the disciples there in Jerusalem once again? Uh, maybe in an effort to get them all in one place and then just throw a surprise and uh, arrest them all, all at once. Um, that was certainly something that could have been easily construed or thought possible. Again, they haven't seen Saul since he had made his way back to Jerusalem and probably hadn't heard the story about Saul's conversion on his way to Damascus. So I'm sure they were a little skeptical and that's uh, pretty much understandable. Um, but again, they were not very willing at all to, to listen. Um, they were afraid of him. Um, so have you ever thought, when I was reading through this scripture and it just made me think, well, how easily and how quickly are we also to dismiss someone else's conversion experience? Um, have you ever thought that the blood of Christ was good enough for you, but not for somebody else? It's like the disciples in Jerusalem were acting that way. They're thinking there's no way that Saul could be saved at this point. Uh, again, they hadn't heard his story. Uh, and that's where it really makes a big difference is sitting down, taking the time, and listening to some people's salvation experience of them getting saved, what it took for the Holy Spirit to convince and convict them and get to them to that point of just finally releasing everything and saying, Lord Jesus, I, I ask you into my heart. That's kind of what happened to Saul, and it did happen to Saul, uh, but the disciples are not aware of that story, so that it's hard for them to understand and accept Saul at this point. Acts 9, 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. 
And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas ends up sitting and talking with Saul, and hearing Saul's story, and believing Saul's story, and defends Saul now to the apostles, just like we read here in the scripture. So Barnabas was putting his name, his reputation, his life kind of on the line in explaining to the apostles that, hey, I, I've spent some time with Saul. I believe he's forthright and he is a, a fellow believer, a follower of the way, just like you and I are now as he's speaking to the apostles. Let's learn a little bit more about Barnabas in Acts 4, um, taught here uh, several weeks ago now. Acts 4, verse 36 and 37 says, And Hoses, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, then he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here we get a picture of, a little bit of a picture of Barnabas called the son of encouragement. Another translation uh, may call it very similarly a son of consolation. So Barnabas just had a, a nature about him where he was just willing to open himself up uh, and listen to people's stories and then find the good in everybody and encourage them in whatever that might be in their gifting or so be it, whatever it is. So we see Barnabas encouraging with finances there in Acts chapter 4 and encouraging with friendship here in Acts chapter 9. So if I go back to Acts um, 27, just so you can see it on the screen behind me, um, Christianity covers all the bases from pediatrics to geriatrics, from the babies in the faith to the mature in their faith. So it's something that we have to remember as we're maturing in our faith, that things are going on all around us and it's not always acceptable what we, what we might be seeing going on. But there's always a story going on behind what we're seeing and what we're hearing. So we need to be open to what's going on. We need to be listening to the, the, the babies in their faith, the people that you know that just like Saul, uh, at this point, Saul has been a believer for quite a while. Remember, he spent three years in Arabia. We talked about that last week uh, under the teaching of Jesus for those three years in Arabia. So he's a very mature believer at this point in time. But we, as we interact with the folks around the, the church and maybe at work or wherever it might be, there's uh, plenty of opportunities to see um, people that are young in their faith, that aren't mature yet. And then and that's what I'm calling the pediatrics, the babies in their faith. Uh, and then there's other people that have maybe been uh, believers for 10 or 20 or 30 years. The, the older, the more mature in their faith, the, the uh, geriatrics is a, a term that you could use there. Um, so be real careful, be discerning on who you're talking to, and be open to the stories that they may be sharing. But then using the discerning Holy Spirit inside of you to understand if what they're telling you is um, uh, following scripture and in truth or not. Verse 28, so he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. From the Galatians chapter 1 account that we read last week, we know that Saul was in Jerusalem for 15 days. So he was there uh, milling around, meeting with Peter mostly, that we read if you read Acts cha or Galatians chapter 1. 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. I wanted to go back here real quick to verse 28. Um, imagine this time, the 15 days that Saul was there in Jerusalem, and again, basically speaking with Peter, uh, imagine the conversations that Peter and Saul of Tarsus must have had. Uh, did Peter take him to the Garden of Gethsemane and walk around these old olive trees that are there? Or did Peter take him to the upper room and then explain what happened there when they broke the bread with Jesus. And then maybe did Saul say to Peter, yeah, Jesus told me about that communion experience that you all had uh, when I was in Arabia with him. 
So there's probably story being swapped back and forth where Jesus had told Saul some things that Saul wasn't privy to, uh, that he didn't experience himself. And then Peter was also sharing some of the firsthand experiences that he had with Jesus to Saul. So that had to be an amazing um, time as well. So now back to verse 29 where he says, And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. Now Saul is disputing against the Hellenists, Jews, in Jerusalem. Uh, how ironic that Saul is sort of kind of picking up where Stephen left off. Remember back in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen stood up in front of the Sanhedrin, the council, uh, and was just boldly proclaiming Jesus and walking them through the scriptures. Um, and Saul was nearby at that time. Um, and they were... And uh, Stephen was speaking to some of the Hellenistic Jews then, and now Saul is, again, speaking against the Hellenistic Jews once again, like Stephen was. Verse 30. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now Saul ended up being back in Tarsus uh, for eight to ten more years up in Tarsus. Um, Twelve to fifteen years now, will have elapsed from the time of Saul's conversion to the time he really starts his own ministry. God was still seasoning and maturing him for his great calling. Caesarea is actually um, north of Jerusalem, uh, much lower than Jerusalem. So most places you go in Israel, you'll see in scripture it also it says many times that they went down to a certain place. Even though Sometimes we think of going down meaning going south, but that's not what we're meaning here. Being Jerusalem is up, I believe, around 2,400 feet above sea level. Uh, most other places in Israel are at sea level, so therefore much lower in elevation. So anywhere you go from Jerusalem, you're actually kind of going down. So now Saul is out of the picture for a little while since he is now back in Tarsus. And the whole uh, point of this the rest of this chapter and for the next three chapters in Acts are going to be really focusing on Peter and his life. Verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Many churches had peace now throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Not sure if this was actually the best thing for the churches, though. Christianity, in general, has always flourished when there's been some sort of persecution going on towards the, ch the church. And now that Saul is back home in Tarsus of Cilicia, that persecution that the church has been undergoing has been removed. So now the churches kind of feel maybe a false sense of peace or security now that Saul has been removed and sent back home. But the good part you can see from the scripture is they were multiplied. So even the, the speculation that it wasn't a good thing for the church, you can see that it was because the church uh, in Scripture says that they were multiplied. So that was an awesome, awesome thing. Another reason, though, that uh, there seemed to be peace among the churches is because Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, uh, died around this time. And he was replaced by another emperor called Caligula. And this Caligula, he wanted to erect a statue of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. So therefore, the, the Jewish energy uh, that was redirected away from persecuting Christians now, which is the, the, where the power came from Saul to go about and persecute uh, the Christians there in Jerusalem, that power uh, had been redirected now towards fighting against this Caligula so he wouldn't put up a statue in the temple there in Jerusalem. So that was another reason there was a sense of peace uh, in the Jerusalem area during this time. Acts 9.32 Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. No doubt some of the people that Peter is encountering as he's starting to travel around now were new converts from the day of Pentecost. Remember back in Acts chapter 2? Uh, that had, So now they had been converted during the day of Pentecost, and now they're going back to their hometowns and sharing all the information that they had heard when Peter spoke boldly and over 3,000 men 
were uh, converted that day and baptized. Um, so not just the 3,000 men, but the, the wives and the children. So they all traveled back to their hometowns and no doubt were spreading the information that they had. They also could have been people that had been fleeing from Jerusalem um, because of the persecution that was happening there by Saul previously before you know he went to Damascus to try and hunt and search down others and bring them bound back to Jerusalem as we read about last week. So these could have been all the people that Peter had been uh, coming across as he was going through all parts of the country. Remember from Acts chapter 8 that Philip had preached up the coastline uh, to Caesarea earlier, so there, had already, there already probably was a strong Christian influence in these cities that Paul, Peter, was coming to. Lydda is about 23 miles down and northeast, though, from Jerusalem. So again, it's down lower in elevation, but in direction, it's northwest of Jerusalem. The Ben-Gurion Airport in present-day Israel uh, is in the city called Lod, L-O-D. So that's the current name of the city, but in Old Testament times it was called Lydda, L-Y-D-D-A, that you see in scripture here. So our first life lesson tonight, God gives the greatest opportunity for ministry to those that are actively involved. God gives the greatest opportunity for ministry to those that are actively involved. Peter was on the move, as we saw in the previous um, passage. He was going around to all parts of the country. Uh, people are easier to direct by God when they are moving. Just like a bicycle, a car, or a boat can't be steered until they're actually in motion. So Peter was being used of God as he was par traveling around different parts of the country. And we're going to see again in the next three chapters uh, the ministry of Peter just coming to life. Um, so that's going to be an awesome experience learning more about Peter as we have already a little bit about Saul. And, and Paul will come back on the picture, into the picture here, um, back in Acts chapter 11 and 12 and so on. Verse 33. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Aeneas was paralyzed for eight whole years. We aren't told if he is a believer at this point. No doubt that he had many bed sores, though, from being in a bed and paralyzed for eight years. Just imagine that. Verse 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. Peter, we've already seen and we'll see more of it, has a great healing ministry of his own. However, Jesus Christ is healing Aeneas right now as Peter is speaking to him. Under that, understand for, that for someone paralyzed for eight years, there's basically probably zero muscle tone in their body in their legs and in their back and their, and their torso area with, that it takes to sit up and to stand up and then to walk. Eight years he hasn't hardly moved. He's been paralyzed. So the blood flow in his body would have been bad. Uh, the nerves and the ligaments have all atrophied and kind of withered and shrunk and they're not strong enough to support the mass of his body anymore. Rehab would have taken years possibly for him to get to the point to be able to get up and start walking as quickly as he did. But God heals him immediately. Uh, those of you that might be in the medical field are a little bit more familiar with this and just have to be amazed and have a great understanding of what is actually taking place in the body of Aeneas. That while Peter was speaking to him, Jesus Christ was healing his body and did Aeneas feel this inside of his body, you know, just strength coming into his body, livelihood and vitality coming into his body? Uh, that just had to be an amazing feeling for Peter to tell him this, to get up, and he arose immediately. Just amazing. Verse 35. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So a great revival is taking place at these places that Peter travels to, such as Lydda and the plains of Sharon. The plains of Sharon are mentioned in many other passages of scripture, 
So now you know where this area is at. It's right around Lydda, in between um, uh, Jerusalem, Lydda, and now we're going to be moving towards Joppa. So verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Joppa is now another eight to ten miles along the same road from Jerusalem to Lydda to Joppa. And it's, again, it's a little bit further northwest. Now we're getting really close to the coast. It's right on the coast. Joppa is where Jonah actually fled when he was supposed to go to Nineveh. If you were here for last um, Thursday's teaching and the Thursday before that, Pastor D.A. was talking about um, Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 2. Um, so we know that Jonah was spoke to by the Lord and he was supposed to go to Nineveh, but immediately he went down to Joppa, got on a boat and head out to sea, the Mediterranean, uh, and he found trouble there. But I'll let you go listen to those uh, teachings online uh, if you want to. But that's the same Joppa that Jonah went to that we're talking about here. Also, Hiram, who back in the times of King David, he was, Hiram was king of Tyre, which remember that map that I showed you? Um, he brought cedar and cypress trees at the request of Solomon and David down the Mediterranean coast from Tyre uh, through uh, Caesarea and then down into the port of Joppa. And those trees were used to build the temple in Jerusalem for Solomon. So you can see the, the miles along the coastline. These trees were kind of cut down, brought to the shore, and probably banded up with some sort of rope and into a mat-like formation so that they would all float down uh, the coastline or they'd have to pull them maybe. Uh, I'm not sure which way the currents were going. Um, but they'd bring them down to Joppa, and then they had to trek 30 to 35 miles inland all the way uphill to Jerusalem to get these timbers there into Jerusalem to build the temple. Joppa also has an incredible history. Um, but before I get... Well, this area has an incredible history, should I say. Lydda, at first, uh, was burned in 65 A.D., and Joppa destroyed in 68 A.D. by the Romans. And in those places, there was 8,000 Jews were slaughtered there at that time. Joppa was taken over by the Muslims eventually. And then Richard the Lionhearted took Joppa and built a citadel there, and he was able to hold out there for about 100 years. Then the brother of Saladin, which is a sultan of Egypt, overcame Joppa and slaughtered 20,000 more Christians there in Joppa during this time of the Sultan of Egypt taking it over. Then eventually Napoleon came there and leveled Joppa, just completely leveled the whole city. Uh, Joppa was rebuilt again by the Ottoman Empire. And then finally, most recently, many that returned to Jerusalem, the Promised Land in 1948, they came through the port of Joppa. So again, a lot of history going back a long time, uh, and this city has been there for obviously a very long time. Verse 36, once again, we go back to that um, because it speaks of Tabitha. Tabitha is her Hebrew name, and Dorcas is her Greek name. Can you guess what both of those names mean? They mean the same thing, and they mean gazelle. Just like the animal bounding through the prairie, that's the gazelle that we're referring to. And we know that this Tabitha, or Dorcas, she was active in using her wealth. Um, I might say or speculate that she was wealthy because she had an upper room uh, that is spoken of here in Scripture. Her ministry was with a sewing needle, and her ministry was for what we might call the less fortunate. Uh, she would provide clothing for many, many people as we see uh, here in scripture coming up as well. And also it mentions here that she was full of charitable deeds, not just full of them, but she did them. She wasn't just full of good intentions, but she actually did many great deeds and helped many people. Verse 37, but it happened in these days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. She was buried 
and washed first, though, in a Jewish burial, white linen shroud called a taharim, tahrahim. The body was laid on a long piece of linen. This linen was probably long in the sense that it was twice her height or a little bit more. So if she was five feet tall, the linen would have been at least 10 feet long. So they would have laid her body down on this lower five foot portion of the linen and then they would have taken the, the other five foot portion and folded it back up over her head, back down to her feet. So now her whole body would have been wrapped in this linen called the taharim. And then they would have tied the linen around her feet and then around her knees and then tied her hands to her sides and her mouth would have been shut as well. And this was just a, a custom of the Jews, which is still going on today. The rich and the poor in Israel are buried alike. Um, they don't really have different type of ceremonies. They bury uh, everyone there similarly. Um, and also not in a coffin, which is customary or typical here in the United States and many other places. Except the soldiers, uh, they were buried in a coffin. Just a little tidbit of information there. Verse 38, And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Again, only eight or ten miles uh, separating Lydda from Joppa. These two men beg Peter to come and ask him not to be offended, but they implore him to come. So, and Peter does this. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Weeping may have been much like convulsing and sobbing. Uh, they are truly brokenhearted here. Uh, you may have heard Pastor David mention in times past, they, in, the, in these days, they sometimes during a funeral, uh, they would hire, mostly women I'm thinking, to be paid mourners. Uh, they would get paid to go to funerals and just wail and scream and cry. Uh, and, th and that's what they got paid for to just kind of, I don't know if it was to get everybody in the sober mood type thing, but they were paid to um, be mourners at a funeral. And these women, though, were not these paid-for mourners that I was just referring to. These men, women were pr truly heartbroken and missing the presence of their friend, Dorcas. Sometimes we forget how much the acts of kindness we do mean to others. So don't ever forsake or think that your acts of kindness are going unseen. Most likely they are truly appreciated and loved by your friends. Verse 40. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Wow. Wow. Who else can you think of in scripture put out people out of a room? Well, the, there may be a story where Jesus actually did this. Jesus did when he prayed for a sick child in Capernaum. Uh, the daughter of Jairus was the person that Jesus went to. He was requested to come there and he did because everyone thought that Jairus' daughter had died. Uh, you can read about this account in Mark chapter 5. So Jesus put out all of those of unbelief and doubt, except Peter, James, and John were allowed to stay in the room with Jesus to experience and see what Jesus was going to do with Jairus' daughter. So in our next life lesson, before any great work of God is done, there must be prayer. Before any great work of God is done, there must be prayer. So don't take prayer lightly at all. We have an awesome prayer team here. Uh, at the end of every service, the prayer team goes forward and we pray with people. Uh, and there's just many, many stories of miraculous things happening here at the bridge. Here's a picture of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And this is, I'm going to share a story about a heating apparatus of the Metropolitan Tabernacle where Charles Spurgeon taught in London in the 1860s, I believe it was, where he 
taught in other buildings before here that were much smaller. And then at, over certain times, he would get it, move into a bigger and bigger building. Um, and sometimes he would have crowds in excess of 10,000 people coming to hear him preach. And then he ended up in this metropolitan tabernacle. And there was a day, there was a morning, the story goes, that he was outside greeting people. And there was five college students uh, that came early one day to hear him preach. And they had never met him before. So they saw this older gentleman on the steps greeting people as they were coming in. And for whatever reason, Charles was the one greeting. And he saw these five college students come in. And he said, by the way, young men, would you like to go see the heating apparatus of this mighty, huge building? Um, I didn't you can see from the inside here how large this building was, and it was quite large. So the young men, not knowing that this was actually Charles Spurgeon that was speaking to them, they said, well, okay, sure. And um, so Charles took the five young men, and he started leading them down through the narrow staircases and hallways to the basement of the building. And then they got down to the basement, and Charles said, here is the heating apparatus for this mighty building. And what he showed them was 700 people praying in the basement. Charles told them, this is what makes it hot. And this is why there is such a great ministry taking place here. These people are praying hard. So can you imagine going down into the basement of the structure and have over 700 people all praying for the service that day? Amazing. So we see Peter saying now, with all due respect, Peter says, get out. I need to pray. Peter put them out. He was essentially saying, get out. I need to pray. We pray in different positions, don't we? Um, some people may fall prostrate on the ground, maybe at your home, and you just want to relax. You lay down flat on your belly and you pray. Uh, a lot of times we just kind of raise our hands, maybe eyes open or eyes closed, lifting our eyes to heaven and praying that way. Uh, a lot of times we just bow our head, close our eyes and pray. Um, and then there's opportunities to, to kneel as well. So you can see here, Peter put them out and knelt down and prayed. So praying on our knees um, oftentimes uh, can be one of the most humble forms of prayer. Um, I know when we did the Crown Financial classes here and now that we do the Financial Peace University classes, um, and the SOD classes, we open everything in prayer, but specifically in School of Discipleship, we ask everyone to get on their knees while we open and close in prayer. And it's just a, a great humble submission to the Lord as we begin and close each class. And then it says here, now Peter turns to her body. Her soul was in the presence of the Lord at this point because she was dead. Can you imagine as she opens her eyes and looks up and sees Peter, says, man, what are you doing? I was in the presence of the Lord and you called me back. Um, I wonder if there was any bitterness there, um, how she must have felt after being in the presence of the Lord and Pe um, Peter praying and having her soul return to her body. Um, just an amazing experience. Verse 41, then Peter, he, gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Peter had to help her up since, remember, she was still wrapped in this taharim. Um, so she had bindings around her ankles and her knees in her hands um, in her mouth. So she had to get help up because she was still bound. And then I'm sure there was a, a moment of unwrapping her from this taharim, this shroud, um, and man, can you just imagine what she was feeling, you know, to know that she was dead, soul in the presence of the Lord, and now she's back on earth um, talking to this person called Peter. Uh, just an amazing experience. So much of that story we don't have recorded in Scripture. Again, another opportunity to speak and find this Tabitha or Dorcas in heaven someday and ask her what that must have been like. 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed on the Lord. Life lesson. We should live for the Lord so people will come to know the Lord. We should live for the Lord so that people will come to know the Lord. Many believed because many knew and loved Tabitha. 
She was a good example of a believer walking, talking, living out her faith. That's what people really need to see, is people walking, talking, and living out their faith. It just makes it so much easier for the unbeliever to see this type of person, to see a Tabitha doing all of the things that she was God-gifted to do. You walk that way, and you talk that way, and you do things that way, you're going to have fruit in your ministry and bringing people to the Lord because they're going to be open to hear whatever you may have to say when they see you living that way. Verse 43. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Simon a tanner. A tanner works with dead animals, something very much unclean for a Jew to be around. The house of a tanner also had a very, very terrible smell. Tanners were excluded from the synagogues. Tanners' houses had to be actually be downwind of any city. So that was something that was very much so looked down upon any tanner in any city. There was a, it was a need for the work that they did, but unfortunately it was such a, a, a lowly job to have. Um, and that's where Peter chose to stay for many days in Joppa. No doubt while Peter was there, uh, maybe even helping out um, Simon the Tanner, uh, or just watching what might be going up in the house, but no doubt Peter saw new wineskins being made and then maybe hung from some sort of uh, curtain rod or string to dry. Um, so he saw these new wineskins hanging in the house and he may have remembered Jesus saying, you can't put new wine in old wineskins, but only new wine into new wineskins. Um, there's a, a physical meaning to that and then a spiritual meaning to that as well. And Peter probably saw these physical wineskins and knew that you couldn't put new wine into an old wineskin because of the, the, the gases that come off of new wine would cause the wineskin to expand and then if it was old and dried and cracked it would it cause the wide skin to burst uh, so that's why it had to be a new wineskin so that it was allowed to stretch and give with the new wine inside of it um, so God was going to speak to Simon Peter through this Simon the Tanner um, we need to believe and trust in the power of God one of the greatest miracles that we can see is God working in someone's life and turning them around. That is an awesome miracle to see, to know somebody for a while that was an unbeliever and through your ministering and talking to them, you and others hopefully, uh, that they eventually walk forward during an altar call or just some other time they give their life to the Lord. And now you get to see a miracle performed by God, how an unbeliever became a believer. Um, and that is just an awesome thing to see. If we fast forward in time to Paul now writing a letter to Timothy, we see in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 and 13, Paul saying, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I attained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So did we just like we were talking about someone uh, going from unbeliever to believer, Saul or Paul here is re remembering back when he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, um, but he obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly. So amazing story there. We've seen Saul's life turned around 180 degrees. Remember that Damascus Road experience. And now we're going to see Peter's life is beginning to be more and more amplified in the next couple of chapters here in the book of Acts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we again thank you, Lord, for this morning, for this opportunity, Lord, to, to be with you and to go through your word. Lord, thank you again for this day. Lord, I pray that we would all be like Tabitha or Dorcas and use the giftings that you've given us, Lord, and to share them with others and minister with others. Become their friend. Listen to their story. Be an encourager like Barnabas. 
Help us, Lord, to help people go from unbelief to belief. And, Lord, we just look forward to hearing those resurrection, not physical resurrection, but maybe, but the resurrection in life of someone that was dead becoming new, a new creation in life in Jesus. So, Lord, I just pray for to hear those stories someday and how people hear, people hearing this message may be able to share with others and how they spend time with an individual, an unbeliever, and then through their witness and through their example, helped this person come to the Lord as their Lord and Savior. So again, thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, we just uh, want to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.